a simple adjustment, a small change to make the process a little easier. Just a few more minutes of work, maybe one hour. Then one hour turns into two, two to six, and days later I'm negotiating a few more days to finish what I started. But before I get too far ahead of myself, this is my bicycle frame jig. I made it nine years ago on a mini mill and a mini lathe. And as you can imagine, it took a while. Now you might be asking, why put yourself through that kind of pain? Aside from not having the space for larger machines, I reflect back on it as a rite of passage, sort of like machine hazing. I was able to push the limits of those machines, and there's something to be said about learning on manual machines to actually feel those limits and rigidity, or in my case, lack thereof. Yeah, we all wish we had larger, more rigid tools, but sometimes smaller is better, said no machinist ever. I was learning a lot and took no time to pause, favoring action over reading the manual. And in my excitement and with my, albeit small tools, I got to work. But like a cargo Celt Islander in the South Pacific, I was oriented around the concept of a jig based on images and drawings that the frame building mystics had bestowed upon the internet. So began the ritual of designing and building my own jig with the belief that doing so would award me a plethora of spiritual and tubular alignment. The plan was simple, based on the Arctos jig, but mine was a mere replica, made of gathered sticks and stones. Sure, it looked like a jig, but could it jig? The answer is yes, and with great accuracy. But the gods of frame building had laid upon it a curse, one that would hinder its use and make the ritual of configuring tubes a horrible plight. And now I must atone. I must exercise this jig to lift the spurn cast upon it by the frame-building gods so many years ago. To right the wrongs. To move forward into the light. To uphold the frame-builder's covenant which states, We build frames not because it's easy, but because we thought it would be easy. That's not the covenant, but it sounds good. All this to say, in this video, I'm fixing my jig. So where did I go wrong? Here and here. Both sections suffer from the same problem. But to understand the problem, let me first explain how to configure this particular jig. To configure the head tube, this drawing shows the head tube bottom approximately 403mm to the right and 370mm above the bottom bracket. With this information, we are able to configure the head tube on the jig. The head tube section of the jig pivots on this bolt here. The lower arm is fixed onto the head tube extrusion. The upper arm is able to slide on the extrusion, allowing it to clamp the head tube. On my jig, the pivot point is not located at the bottom of the head tube. So when configuring the head tube angle, its bottom reference point moves to an arbitrary position. And so measuring from this new position is not impossible, but quite challenging and time consuming. To remedy this problem, some jigs use a flat puck for the bottom arm. The contact surface of the puck is located at the pivot axis. Configuring the head tube angle does not change the location of the head tube reference point. For my jig, I will not use a puck. I prefer to stick with a cone. So to index the head tube reference point, I will enable the bottom arm to slide up and down, allowing the arm to position the reference point on the pivot axis. The C-tube section suffers from the same problem. Its pivot point is far above the bottom bracket. Configuring the C-tube angle moves the bottom bracket center more ass out than Kim Kardashian and Beyonce combined. The fix for this is simple. Move the pivot point to the bottom bracket center. Now that we've got our plan, let's get to work. Oh wait, one more thing. This radius is too small, which makes the clamping action less effective. We'll fix that too. To save on materials, I'm modifying the existing head tube base plate. This is the point where I decided to update the clamping plate. I wanted to increase the max radius, so clamping the profile seemed like the best option. This approach is easier than slotting a radius and does not require a rotary table.
the best position for the pivot point is actually higher on the extrusion. This gives the lower arm more space to slide, so a new extrusion was countersunk and drilled to secure the lower arm while also enabling it to slide on the extrusion. A screw must secure a T-nut at its base. This meant drilling a hole straight through the arm. Fortunately, there was enough clearance for the screw that secures the cone. Now on to drilling new hole positions for the plate. The original plan had the radius plate secured directly to the extrusion by drilling and tapping the extrusion. I scrapped that idea and opted for securing it by T-nut instead. So a new plate was machined to interface the radius plate to the extrusion. Here I will use screws with a countersink head. Normally I would use a socket cap screw instead, but the material was just not thick enough. Drilling and tapping the radius plate to accept the interface plate. Both parts are clamped to a flat surface. While tightening the screws, because they are tapered head, I had a bad feeling about it. The tapered head might have indexed both plates away from the flat surface. I'll fix that later. I'm not sure about the terminology for this part. I'll call it a clamping sleeve. This will need to be turned down and milled to spec. My original choice was brass, but it's not a good idea because brass and aluminum are not compatible with each other and will produce galvanic corrosion. So aluminum it is. A relief is needed because of the radius it will need to slide along. Without the relief, the part could roll and cause it to bind on the radius. And another relief on the bottom side to allow more downforce of the clamping edge, where it will contact the radius plate. And just a quick fix to the radius plate surface. A skim over the surface to ensure both parts are aligned and alleviate my plantar neurosis disorder. Nice, slicker than a dolphin's d and tighter than d And now, onto the C-tube section. After a few iterations, I came up with this template for the C2 base plate and then transferred it to a drawing. Now the smart thing would have been to have just purchased 15mm Mic 6, but I found a deal on 5 8 remnants that I could not refuse. Why spend 30 extra dollars when you can spend 3 hours facing aluminum instead?
the plate requires a radius. Its center is the bottom bracket center. This is where the C-tube extrusion will pivot. After marking with a center drill, the radius is scribed with a compass. Now it's okay to drill the bottom bracket center. Cutting the radius on the band saw went much faster because I changed out the new saw blade. And sanding the radius went faster too with a new belt. I also found that applying less pressure allows the sander to do its job. Applying too much pressure will slow down the belt and the slower belt means slower sanding action. Laying out the index bolts. These bolts will slide inside the extrusion slots and keep the plate aligned. The old plate uses press fit inserts, but turning these down to size is too time consuming. So instead, I'll drill and tap for M10 threaded rod and turn down the rod for inserts. Turning the first insert didn't go so well. I didn't want to mar the thread so it wasn't tightened down enough. Onto the bottom bracket block. It is secured to the back side of the extrusion with this securing block. But because the new design has the bottom bracket block flat against the base plate, we need to relocate the securing block to the side instead. Drilling and tapping the center of the backside. A screw will be installed here to secure it and allow it to pivot on the base plate. Just like the head tube radius plate, the C-tube plate also needs a clamping sleeve, except this one is larger. And now with a stationary head tube reference point and a stationary bottom bracket reference point. I am allowed to stickity stick some scales onto this jig. And as a final touch, some acrylic scale markers. Although these were not the final markers, the little triangles were distracting.
So these are the final markers. And the bottom bracket marker required a bend. This is not the greatest lathe. It does okay. The main reason I chose it was its large center bore. It will accept large diameter tubes, which come in handy for frame building. A 3D printed gauge helps me align the lower arm to get the tube's bottom right on axis. As alluded to at the start of the video, I was not planning on making these changes, at least not in the middle of the current frame build. But here we are, and I'm glad to have finally done it. If you are interested in the updated plans to this jig, they are now in the store section of my website, pithybikes.com. If you are interested in a kit version of this jig, please send me an email, pithybikes at gmail.com. If there's enough interest, I'll look into our production run, and the folks who emailed will be at the top of the list. Thanks for watching, stay humble, and I'll see you all in the next one.